right, so that's a that's a very nice work by the Nikshita. We Francis back, I believe from 2019. All right, and so the setup is very generic. So you we just need to define a mapping that is differentiable. So what it maps from some space of parameters to some space of functions. Okay, so think really in your mind that big capital theta are the parameters of your neural net, and and you know capital F is the space of functions that are parameterized by these neural nets. Okay, and uh, so this is a parameter space, and this is the function space. And let uh, theta zero to be the initial point of the learning algorithm. And here we are really going to focus on gradient descent. All right. So <clears throat> the an important object that is defined is okay. This mapping a priori can be arbitrary, right? So like a can be nonlinear. So what we consider is its linearized version, right? So linear approximation of the model at initialization. So let's describe that. That's we're going to introduce the linearized tangent model at initialization. Right, so this is something we're going to write with, with a bar on top. So it's a model that is just a zeroth order approximation plus the first order approximation. Let me just write it like this. The derivative of phi at theta zero times theta minus theta zero. Okay, and so this, just to make sure that, uh, that we are all comfortable with the notation, so this is a function, right? So we can, uh, uh, you know, in, in coordinates, if you want to know, like um, what this means is that if I look at this function, and I validate at some point x, that's taking the original mapping. So at theta zero plus the sum or the coefficients of the, of the, um, the model, theta j minus theta, or like the coordinate theta j, if you want, the coordinate theta j at time zero times the gradient at, theta, at a corresponding the theta j of the model initialized at time zero. Theta zero evaluated at x. All right. So these, like these are the, so think about what, what this is actually saying you. These are <clears throat> some um, fixed family of let's say features, right? So these are just uh, functions that map from the input to some target space and they are only dependent on theta zero, right? So there's no, you cannot change them, right? Like the, the, the parameter that we are evolving is theta, right? So this, this uh, linearized model depends on theta and these functions do not depend on theta. Okay, so here what you are really defining is a model that is, um, so the remark that observe phi bar is linear or affine with respect to theta, okay? This doesn't mean that it's, it's not linear with respect to the input x, right? It's linear with respect to the parameter, okay? So generally, Okay, so this is really something that should remind you of uh, what you saw uh, last Tuesday, right? Because uh, if you think about uh, the functions that are in a, RK, in a RKHS, in a reproducing kernel Hubert space, when uh, there was this, uh, I guess, representation that Sebastian described, there is this representation in terms of features, right? You can always represent the functions that in RKHS as linear combinations of fixed features, 
So these are the features. Okay, so here the model is really just, uh, as you can see here, right? The only place that theta arises is here, right? So it's just a linear model. All right. So I guess that the, the question really <clears throat> that, uh, that this work addressed and, and, and the important question for us now is when is gradient descent When is gradient descent learning under those two models? Okay, so we have two models now. We have the original one that is not a nonlinear one and the linearized one. Similar. Okay, so here the question is that we have uh, this uh, a priori in black box architecture, it's just differentiable and we are defining an algorithm to learn with this architecture that is just gradient descent. And we are uh, considering a linear approximation of this complicated model, which is given by this uh, tangent model. And we're asking when is this linear approximation going to be good, not just at initialization, but also throughout the dynamics. Okay, so in the sense that the algorithm is at the end not, not going to make much difference between using one or the other. Why do you think this is an interesting question? Well, which model do you think is easier to understand and to analyze? Just to make sure that people are following. The linearized version. Linearized version, right? Because this is just a model that is linear with respect to the parameters, right? So gradient descent over linear model should be easy to address, right? So let's. So this is the question that is uh, we are going to try to to focus on in the next minutes. Okay, so for that, we are just going to define uh, dynamics, right? So for this, we need the loss function. So we define the loss function. That is just applying some loss to the model, to the function. Okay, and so think, for example, uh, in, uh, for example, uh, energy, the loss with respect to the parameters can be just some, some L2 distance between this function and some target function. Okay, we are going to use mostly this kind of loss. And assume an initial point so that the error is non zero. Okay, it's like, a, sorry, that the error yeah, is, is, is away from zero. Okay, some initial point such that the energy of theta zero is strictly equal to zero. Otherwise, there would be no, no, no dynamics at all. Now we consider the gradient step. What is a gradient step is an update of the parameters that looks like this, right? So we move on the parameters in the direction of the steepest descent. Okay, so we are moving, we are evolving in the space of parameters. And so now we are gonna track two simple quantities. The first quantity is to see how much has this change, this this update on the parameters, how much has it changed our objective function? And we are gonna measure it in a relative sense, right? So we just consider the relative change in objective function. So that's something that we can, um, uh, we can just denote by, let's say some Delta E, which is, this is the loss that we had before minus the new energy divided by the energy we had at the beginning. And now we can just uh, do whatever it takes to have some approximation, right? So we can, uh, we know that this difference, right? This is equivalent, like, uh, so if we approximate it at first order, this is, a, this is a, the first order approximation is the gradient of the energy at time zero times theta one minus theta zero. Yeah, and what is theta one minus theta zero? If you look above, that's also proportional to the gradient, right? So what you see here is that this is equal to the theta times the norm of the gradient 
theta zero squared. And so here I have the same divided by E of theta zero. Right? So that's how much the function changes. But now if we wanna really uh, assess how much the dynamics are seeing the nonlinear flavor, the nonlinear nature of the model, we could also look at how does the linear structure, how does the tangent space, the tangent plane change? Okay, so we are gonna measure that as well. In, I could call it like a tangent model, right? And so why, why do I care about that? If you think about like a structure, like a function that is nonlinear, <clears throat> What is the way to characterize the fact that the function is nonlinear? Is the fact that the derivative changes this with respect to the position, right? Like a function that is linear, uh, the derivative that the slope is the same everywhere, right? So that the linear model doesn't change. But if a function is nonlinear, the tangent space changes, right? So we need to, we need to quantify how much does it change. So we just look at the same thing, but instead of looking at the loss, we just look at the, at the derivative structure. Okay, so this is something that we can measure by look, comparing the two Jacobian matrix, the two Jacobian operators, right? So we can just measure their operator norm, the operator norm of the difference. And we can also normalize by, let's say the norm, the operator norm at time zero. And we can just uh, now, again, uh, uh, use the same uh, Taylor approximation for the approximation. So like the changes in the Jacobian, I can control them by making the, the relevant assumptions by the learning the, the learning rate times maybe like the norm of the second derivative of the function. Right here, I'm just doing Taylor again, times <coughs> the difference between the theta one and theta zero, but the difference between theta one and theta zero is again proportional to eta times the norm of the, the gradient. Right. So here I have the norm of the gradient that appears again. Okay, so here we are just using um, like the first order. Okay, so we are not even using the, I mean, we are just using the fundamental theorem of calculus, right? You are just saying that, uh, you know, f of one minus f of zero is smaller than the soup of f prime of t times, um, like uh, in that sense, like uh, a and b, right? So a and b. Okay, that's just uh, that's just the nature of this inequality. All right. So now that we have these tools, what is the what do you think is a, is a natural way to define when a model uh, truly behaves like a you know truly behaves like a linear or nonlinear model? So what what we're interested in is to understand how these two changes compare to each other. Right. So we say that. That the differentiable model operates in the lazy regime. Okay, so it's going to be lazy when the relative change in the in the differentiable structure is going to be much much smaller than the relative change in the loss. Okay, so in other words, tangent model evolves much slower than the loss. So for the purposes of, uh, if, if the goal of the algorithm is to find slow, low, uh, low values of the loss, it doesn't really need to move the tangent space, right? It can just uh, stay with the same linear model, right? That's in a sense, it's lazy because it, does, it just do, does the minimum thing that it needs to do to get the loss to zero. But as you know, one of the nice things about uh, machine learning and deep learning in particular 
is that we are not just interested in optimization, right? If we were interested in optimization, that would be a, fun, a wonderful thing to, to understand, like a wonderful thing to observe, right? I mean, if I can minimize my problem with linear model, why, why bother with complicated structures? Well, the, the beauty of uh, deep learning and machine learning is that this is not always the right answer, right? And so here we really want to detect this lazy regime more as a, as a warning, right? That something is perhaps wrong in the picture, okay? <clears throat> and so uh, just, as, just as a way to maybe simplify this, uh, uh, this formula, right? So, so this formula here, that's uh, something that you can now take the, <clears throat> take the terms that we had before, but uh, just to give you like something a bit more user-friendly. So if we now use again the same loss before, if we consider that the loss, as I said before, is just a L2 distance. Um, <clears throat> then the, the lazy regime. So, so now then, like let's call this, this uh, let's call this, quantity star, then uh, we verify that this condition is equivalent <coughs> to the fact that the model at uh, minus the target the distance times the ratio between the Hessian and the norm of the Jacobian squared is much smaller than one, okay? And that's what we call, we call it is kappa phi at theta. That's the relative scale Okay, and so this is really the condition um, that then we can uh, understand. Okay. I see that there's some questions. Is there any, any questions? Uh, no, good. Okay. So what is this? Uh, so how can now we make this quantity precise? Right, That's so this- question, uh, John. Yes. Yes, yes, phi, uh, sorry, phi is differentiable, right? So you can compute uh, first and second order derivatives. Yes. Think about phi, phi as a um, uh, morally a neural network where the activation function admits, uh, you know, first derivative and second derivative. Okay, so, so we have, um, uh, and actually uh, Leonique and, and Francis and uh, Edouard actually found a, a pretty concrete quant quantitative way to actually exploit this relative scale. Okay, so this is in this theorem from uh, uh, Leonie uh, Shiza, Oyelon and back. That is, is this the their theorem 2.3 that I just simplify here. But hopefully, it just gives you the, the flavor. That assume, and that's the assumption that uh, I think uh, um, Anirup was asking, that phi and d phi <clears throat> are both Lipschitz. So let's not for let's not worry so much about uh, um, differentiability um, in a neighborhood. of theta zero. And now we define two trajectories, right? So let first trajectory is, uh, sorry, phi of t, right? Uh, and I forgot, I made a typo again, sorry. It's theta of t, right? Which is the Nonlinear 
gradient flow that solves this uh, ODE, right? This ordinary differential equation, which is just the negative gradient of the loss evaluated fit of theta of t. Okay, so I'm just doing gradient flow with respect to the to the nonlinear model, right? And now I define the analogous version, theta of t, that is the linearized gradient flow that solves the same the OD, but I replace phi by its linearized version. Minus gradient of the energy. Sorry, and this is wrong. Uh, so this is in my notation that should be in the loss. Okay, because the energy is already defined over the parameters. With respect to phi bar of theta bar of t. <clears throat> okay, so we have uh, in in pictures. If I want to try to draw, draw a picture, I have some. Um, So the nonlinear model in the space of functions, and I have some uh, maybe linearized model that starts at that they match at theta zero, and I have one trajectory here that is evolving. Right, this is this uh, flow, and then I have another flow that starts at the same, the same point that evolves over the nonlinear space, right, which is a theta of t, and both are just gradient flows with respect to uh, the corresponding uh, uh, model. All right. So then <clears throat> there exists then for, it exists some constant that only depends on the model um, such that for t smaller than this constant, um, it holds that the function, right? So if I evaluate the function, evaluated at the gradient flow, like basically how the function evolves, if I compare these two functions, they're relative, uh, <clears throat> relative to the target, right? So uh, like relative to the error I had at time zero, this quantity is controlled up to constant of the problem that, you know, like the Lipschitz constant, etc. This is controlled by t squared times the relative scale of the model at initialization. Okay, so this relative scale is the thing that we just introduced just before, right? This is the relative scale. Okay, so here really you have an, a result that is quite intuitive, right? So I told you that this relative scale is a way to measure kind of like the curvature of the space of functions at initialization, right? So in the sense that if this relative scale was zero, it means that my space of functions, in fact, was just defining a linear subspace, right? In the space of functions. So think about this as like kind of a curvature. So the more, like the, the less curvature my space of function has, the smaller the error if I, of linearization, right? And, and but this, what, what is remarkable in this result is that it, this is not just the error I have at the beginning, right? The error somehow is controlled, right? It has a certain control, right? Like uh, it include it, it here in this in this formulation, it it just increases uh, quadratically with time. But in fact, um, there's a remark here that I want to make. Is that um, <clears throat> here is a here is a, we have a finish time here uh, we present. finite time result, but under, under can I say like stronger or like further conditions, further assumptions. Uh, the, the authors managed also to extend it. Uh, it can be extended. Okay, so this is um, 
uh, so this result is uh, basically uh, quantifying or like uh, formalizing the, this intuition that if you if your if your model at initialization has small curvature, then you are gonna you are not gonna make a big error if you want to understand what the model is doing by replacing it by its linearized version. So again, depending on uh, on which community you come from, you might take this result as being great news or as being very bad news. Um, so let's see. Uh, let's try to make uh, things a bit more concrete, right? So now, like the question I'm asking here is um, when does lazy regime happen? Okay, so I just described something pretty, pretty abstract here. Um, so now we would like to understand when exactly does this happen. So let's just to motivate, let's first consider a scale model. Okay, just to show, just to, to illustrate how powerful this characterization is. Right, so I'm just going to do something very simple. So I'm just going to consider a model that now I introduce one parameter alpha. That the only thing it does is just scale a previous model. Okay, and let me just pull from the previous uh, description. Uh, let me just uh, uh, pull the definition of the relative scale. Right, so you can actually. Yeah. Okay, so that's the, that's a the relative scale that we had. So let's compute, uh, let's see how, how this uh, relative scale depends on alpha now. Okay, so we just uh, compute um, um, just uh, by direct computation, we can just look at the relative scale of the model with alpha, initialize at the parameter theta zero. So this becomes, as you can see, this ratio here, right? The ratio that you see that you have um, uh, here, right? Let me just put it like this. So this ratio here, right, is not homogeneous, right? So what happens if you, what happens if with the ratio as a function of alpha? Just to see uh, how people, uh, if people follow. So what happens with the numerator uh, as you as you multiply the function by alpha? You have an alpha. You have a factor alpha in the numerator, and you have an a factor alpha squared in the denominator. Thank you, right? Because the, the factor alpha squared, the factor alpha here is a square, right? So you get like a factor of one over alpha from this ratio, right? And the model, uh, uh, I can just write the error at times zero like this, right? Minus f times the original ratio that I had before. Okay, so now in particular, um, and and, and a, a particularly important class way to initialize uh, functions in deep learning is to initialize the model so that the initial function is zero, right? That's kind of like it's called a centering condition. Okay, so when when the initial function is zero, what you see is that, and we have that the relative scale at theta zero is just the original relative scale divided by alpha. Okay, because the, the term here, the first term that you see here does not depend on alpha, right? This is just the norm of the original. It's the, it's the like the initial error is just like the norm of the target. So in particular, you see that this thing is going to zero as alpha goes to infinity. Okay, so this seems like a, uh, if you if if your goal is to prove results about uh, optimization, 
Here you have a very, very simple way to do it, right? You give me any model, even if it's like a super complicated, uh, you know, 100 layer neural network. I'm just going to decide that I'm going to initialize it, right? I'm just going to scale the parameters, right? I'm just going to, you know, reparameterize the model so that uh, at the output, I just multiply it by alpha and I make alpha very, 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 very large. But I also make it such that at initialization, right, I have uh, the zero function, right? So maybe I can, I can uh, you know, have neurons and their negative neurons, right? So they cancel. So this will make your network behave in the lazy regime, which means that you are going to have very good analysis of gradient trajectories, gradients and trajectories, OK? Uh, there's another, of course, there's another simple variant of the scale model, which is a homogeneous model. Which is also very, uh, very relevant for machine learning. Okay, so what is a homogeneous model? Homogeneous model is a model that if I scale the parameters, I get the same function, but with some uh, you know factor at the output, right? That's a, that's the homogeneous function, right? So this is true for all theta, and let's say that is lambda positive. Okay, so here we have the same thing, right? Because uh, um, same as a four, just because uh, can, you can see here, right? That, uh, that uh, scaling the parameters or scaling the function is equivalent up to this like uh, exponent r, right? If r equals one, you can see that it's exactly the same thing as we had before. So in that case, we know that the relative scale, if I just change initialization, Right, so if I scale the initialization of the parameters, <clears throat> it's going to be um, one over lambda to the r, the relative scale of the of the initial model at at, at time zero. Right, again for okay. And finally, the last example I want to illustrate is the one that we really need to. <clears throat> that's going to be very useful for us today is the, the single hidden layer neural network. <coughs> okay, so what is the single what is the single hidden layer neural network in this context? It's going to define a model that has m neurons, right? So this is a as you can see, it's going to be a very simple neural network that I'm going to scale with some factor alpha of m times the sum from g equals 1 to m of some function. OK, and then I'm going to just draw theta i that are i id from some law. OK, so think about, for example, uh, as an example, we are going to use this model also uh, the rest of the lecture today. But the example would be that the g of theta, right, is a function that when I apply it to x, gives me like the, you know, let's say the ReLU of x with, um, uh, just use notation that I'm going to use later, some a plus some b, right? That could be an example of uh, this simple function. And I'm going to I'm going to define this function right and and so I'm going to draw the parameters of this so basically my my model here is a linear combination of functions and I initialize these functions iid and I just also uh, ensure that in expectation this function right so the expectation over mu bar or g of theta is the zero function okay it's like a center condition and uh, also assume that dg, like the, the Jacobian of, uh, like or the gradient of g is the Lipschitz. <clears throat> okay. So this is a model uh, of a single hidden layer neural network of M neurons. And I'm just gonna interest that uh, I, I wanna understand how should I, Normalize, or like a, what is the scaling I need to use uh, when I define this model? 
Okay, so let's now try to compute. Uh, so we want, what we want to understand, right? So we want to understand how this uh, um, scaling, the, the, the relative scaling of the model in expectation, right? Expectation over the parameters of the relative scaling of this function. Okay, so like that. All right, so we need to compute all these different terms that are, in, that, are that appear in the relative scaling. So the first one is how does the norm of the function uh, depend on M? So we are just, uh, let's go to the definition, right? So phi of M is a sum of independent functions, right? Like these functions, G of theta one, G of theta two, G of theta three, they're independent, right? Because I draw I draw the, the parameters theta independently. So what happens with the square norm? Well, the square norm is just going to be like the, the sum of norm, right? So I have m times alpha of m squared times the energy, like the expected norm of j theta squared, right? Since theta size are iid. Okay, that's the first term. Now let's compute the gradient, right? The gradient of the time of phi, sorry. Okay, so this is just, uh, <clears throat> just look at the scaling. So I just recover alpha of m times the gradient of g with respect to each of the parameters, right? So I have uh, the gradient of g of theta one, the gradient of g with respect to theta n. Okay, so we are gonna first compute the the squared norm of this um, the squared operator norm of this matrix. So for this, we can just look at the outer product. Okay, so let's consider like d of phi m of theta times d of phi m of theta transpose. Right? Because we are really, we wanted to compute the square norm. The square operator norm is the norm of the outer product. <coughs> and let me just, just to make things a little bit more um, um, apparent, let me normalize. So I'm going to normalize by m times alpha m squared. So this alpha m squared that you have here in the in the, in the denominator is going to cancel the alpha m. So these two these two terms, right? This term square here and this term square this term here because because I have it twice, they're going to cancel each other, right? So what I get is just one over m, and then because these metrics are like uh, you know very thin, right? So I just have like basically the sum from j equals one to m of the uh, respective other product. But now each of the theta i, right? Theta j times d of g of theta j transpose. Okay. So now what happens <clears throat> as M grows? If M is very, if, if M is very large, right? In the large M, <clears throat> what, where does this thing converge to? Someone can help me. So I have a sum. I have a sum, right? Um, it's not quite a zero, but I have a sum of independent objects, right? Like each of these is a matrix, right? It's a random matrix, right? Because the theta is random, but these are independent draws. They are drawn from the same distribution, right? And I have an average, right? So what do we know about averages of independent variables? Where do they converge? It's the moment it's the square. Good, thank you. Okay, so this converges to the expectation of dg of theta times dg of theta transpose. Thank you. Right, that's the, the law of large numbers. Okay, so it means <coughs> that to so this, what we are just showing is that this uh, norm, like in expectation, of the uh, phi m of theta 
squared, right? This is by definition the expectation of the phi m of theta times the phi m of theta transpose, right? This is a converging. I, I'm just going to write it like this. Just we are we are not very we are not going we are not very precise here. This is just uh, by what we are just what we have just said. This is approximately equal to m times alpha m squared times this quantity, uh, this this moment, right? The g of theta. Okay. So here, what remember that what we are interested in is the dependency, the scaling on alpha and on m. Okay, like this, you can treat this as a constant, right? Like this term here, you can just treat it as a constant. All right. So now we have um, the, the, the zero moment here, the first moment here, and now we just need the Hessian. So let's compute the Hessian. Okay, so the definition of the operator norm. is by definition, the soup for any unit norm vector. And u here is in gonna be in d times m, right? So d are the parameters of the thetas and m is the number of neurons of alpha m times from g equals one to m of u j transpose <coughs> times d squared of g of theta j times u j. Okay, this we're just looking at the definition of uh, the operator norm, right? Like this. Okay, and now we are just we can just upper bound this quantity, right? By um, instead of taking the sum of the sum of the sum, we take the sum of the sum. Okay, so this is going to be alpha m the soup with respect to theta i of the Hessian, like the operator of the Hessian at g at each point. And now we use the assumption, remember that what we said above, is that this thing is Lipschitz, right? So if the, if the, if the gradient is Lipschitz, what do, we know, what do we know about the norm of the Hessian of g? Which is the gradient of the Jacobian? This is this cannot be. This is no more than the Lipschitz constant of the Jacobian, right? So this is alpha m times another constant, which is the Lipschitz of the Jacobian. Okay. So this is uh, you know this is just uh, because we are. Uh, soup of the sum is bigger, is uh, uh, smaller than the sum of soup. And this is because um, in a function, right, like the, you know, the soup over x of the gradient of f of x is by definition, the Lipschitz constant of f. Okay. All right, so now we have to put, we can put it all together. Um, so also, we, so the last thing we know is that, the, of course, from the, from the triangle inequality, the original error that we have, right? Like the error at time zero, theta minus F star, I can, uh, I can upper bound it uh, in a way that is pretty brutal, but just the sum of the norms. Okay, so we have a, also we already have a control, right? So this quantity here, we already have the control here, right? All right, so now we put everything together. What do we get? We know that the, so we get that this relative scale is going to be controlled by first is like the error, like the, the first error that is the thing that we have here. So this is going to be 
some constant that we get like gets called C1, that is a constant that doesn't depend on M on alpha, which is this guy here, plus the square root, which is uh, the square root of what we had before, which is then it's called it's gonna be m square root of m times alpha m times another constant if you want. And now we need to look at the ratio. So we had the um, Hessian, which is here behaving as alpha m, right? So we have some alpha of m times another constant divided by the square of the Jacobian. Now the Jacobian, which was here, which is m times alpha m squared times another constant. Okay? And so now we can stare at that and see how this quantity behaves as m and of alpha. And you can see that this is a, a, by just looking at the two terms, we have one term by just renaming the constants, if you want, that grows as one over square root of m. Right, which is the, the one of the terms. And then the other one that is gonna grow as M times alpha M, right? That's the corresponding to the first term. Okay, so that's the, the final result, right? That we wanted to, to show here. So, now I ask the question, what is this like a hidden, one single hidden layer neural network? When is it gonna enter the lazy regime? So the first term, right, is always gonna go to zero when the width of the network is sufficiently wide, right? When M grows, this is going to zero. So now I have the problem like as a conclusion, if the denominator here grows with M, then both terms are gonna to go to zero, right? So if M times alpha M goes to infinity as M grows, then this model will become lazy in the overparameterized limit, right? In the overparameterized. So basically M large regime. Okay, so in particular, if you have scalings of alpha, like for example, in particular, The, I, think, I believe that um, <clears throat> Sebastian described the NTK, the neuron tangible kernel, um, uh, last uh, last session. Uh, NTK considers alpha of m. That, if you remember, it was one over square root of one one over square root of m, right? Which means that uh, this object indeed goes to zero, right? So m alpha of m is square root of m, right? So as I said, as a conclusion, there's a positive side of the conclusion, which is that uh, this will guarantee global convergence. Okay, so optimization. is easy. But this cannot be all the story, right? There's a negative side of all this regime, right? Which is that uh, we are, in essence, giving up on the nonlinear uh, nature of the model, right? So basically, if 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 the lazy was if the lazy training was everything that there was in neural networks, then why would we use neural networks? Why don't we just use the kernels instead? Okay, so basically we are um, here. What I'm saying is that um, so we are learning. <clears throat> 
only a linear combination. Of fixed feature maps. Okay, and the and the, the keyword here is that it's fixed, right? Remember that the linearized model uh, at initialization theta zero hasn't seen any data, so theta zero completely determines the tangent plane. So the model is just going to be using whatever features uh, theta zero decided to create. Right, so these are not adapted to the data. So basically, what it means is that this is like a, there's no um, no representation learning. Okay, so when we say representation learning, we really typically mean extract like the model learns features that are useful for the task. Right, so here there's no there's no representation that is learned at all, right? You are just learning a linear combination of predefined features. And in fact, you can actually so see that the, this has, you can quantify the, the limitations of this model in many ways, right? So this is really typically the, the so the right way to study this, right? So like the, um, so basically the associated, let me just write it here. Associated a functional space is the arc RKHS with the kernel generated by the by the NTK, right? Like basically, this is just the the um, uh, let's say like the Chokovian, right? Basically, the features. Okay, so given by the, 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 the Jacobian of the network at initialization. So in particular, even a single neuron, right? So if I think about like a function F star, that would be, G, would be just like a G of some theta star with X, right? Like if my goal was to, to approximate and learn a single neuron, <clears throat> it's not in the RKHS. Okay, in the sense that it has infinite, uh, it's, its norm, right? Like the RKHS norm blows up in dimension, right? So like the model cannot even understand theoretically why we cannot learn just a single neuron, right? And that's uh, on the details of this, you can, there's many places, but maybe the, 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 the nicest one is the one by Francis, right? Like the book, the nice paper by Francis, okay? So this leaves us with a very natural question that maybe some of you might be asking is that, okay, maybe we just wanna get away from this regime, right? So we wanna avoid this thing. So what is the natural transition here? What is the natural uh, limitation, right? So the question is what happens when M times alpha M, instead of, instead of growing, right? It stays at the same order, right? What happens when M of alpha M is just a constant? Okay, so in particular, alpha m to be one over n, right? If just you say that this is equal to one. Okay, so uh, what happens is we're gonna be describing in the next uh, hour and a half, but uh, uh, maybe we can take now a, a two minute break and I'll be, uh, so we are gonna continue with the story in two minutes. Okay, let, me just, let me just give you the title of what falls next. It's shallow neural networks. And interaction systems. Okay. Okay, so now just let's assume and then let's recall our model for shallow networks. And hopefully the notation is gonna be consistent. Um, okay, so now we have a hypothesis that is 
parameterized by positions, parameters theta one to theta m. And now we are gonna adopt the normalization that we just uh, described before, which is now one over m, m of these simple functions. Theta j that depends on x. And for an example, so these functions g can be whatever, but just look as a motivating example, just think that uh, these functions, for example, are uh, rich functions, right? That we described also a few weeks, a uh, couple of weeks ago. Okay, so this, for example, can be, I don't know, like a sigmoid value, uh, et cetera. Okay, and so we collect the parameters, uh, A, B and C. So these parameters are in R, um, B, um, times R and R. Let me just call this parameter space to be D, okay? So capital D is the parameter space where the neurons evolve, right? The neuron parameters contain, uh, so this is what's called, uh, doesn't really matter, but this is like, a, so we have three sets of parameters, right? So this is the output weight. This is the input weight. And this is what's called the bias. Okay, so all these things are collected, boom, into a single parameter that which is like a vector of dimension D, D plus two, right? Okay, and now we consider the least squares regression. So I have mean over theta one to theta m of some loss. So I, I will collect. Uh, so this thing I can I can call it like with a with a with a arrow on top, which means that I have like this m copies of this parameter, like one for each neuron. So I just define some loss that looks like this, right? Like a phi of theta minus f star plus some regularization. Right, uh, and this regularization can be like a function that we can call v of theta with a v of theta. It's just like a, an average again of some function that depends on its position. Right, so think about this regularization, maybe like the, the norm of the weights or something like this. Okay. So um, by developing the square, by expanding the square, uh, what we get is that we get that this loss of theta, if I expand things around, I get it. this is the, the norm of the function. So this norm, like, let me just uh, also uh, recall, right? Uh, like the norm of a fun of a, any function. Uh, this notation, right? What, what we mean by this notation is the expectation with respect to the data of f of x squared, right? It's like the it's like the the mean is the it's the L two norm with respect to the data distribution. So we get the and and we are gonna maybe drop the this this sub index just for ease of notation. Okay, so we get this uh, decomposition, which is like the dot product between uh, theta and f star plus the norm of theta plus lambda of theta. Okay. Now let me just introduce a um, little bit more notation uh, just very quickly. So let's introduce two functions. 
So we have one function that we can call capital F. It's a function that is defined from the domain D to R, and it maps any parameter theta to F of theta, which is defined as the dot product between G of theta and F star minus um, one half times lambda times this function V of theta. Right, so remember again, just to, to, to um, do not introduce confusion, what do we mean by this dot product? This is just, uh, again, uh, the expectation with respect to the data distribution of um, f of x times g of x. Okay, and in the case of the empirical distribution, right, this can be, you can also think it as one over n, the sum from y to n of f of x i. So we have this function, and then we define another function k that goes from d times d, and it takes two pairs of parameters, theta, theta prime, and it map, maps it to just a correlation between theta, g of theta and g of theta prime. Okay. So you will see that uh, in particular, observe that k is symmetric, of course, and PSD, okay? Because it's a dot product, right? So it's a positive semi-definite. All right, we have these two functions. So how can we use these two functions now to you know, clean up a little bit these losses, right? So in these two functions, like the loss, let's try to use F and K to clean up the loss. So the loss becomes, again, it's the loss with respect to all this collection of parameters. So that's first term, the first term here, right? Is, um, um, this, is, this is something that doesn't depend on the parameters at all, right? So we can just, in a sense, we can we can forget about it. Uh, it's something that doesn't doesn't change anything for us. Okay, so we we may just square write it here for the last time. That's the constant that is irrelevant. And now, by just looking at the, this dot product here, right? So what is this phi of of this? Why what is this phi of um, theta? This is the sum of g's, right? So this is and because of the dot product here. Sorry, I don't know if you see my, my uh, you don't see my cursor, sorry, I was wrong. So here we have a, um, a sum of terms, right? So uh, we write it here. So we have two over M, the dot product of the sum from J equals one to M of G of theta J with F star, let's just do it all together, plus the norm of the sum from g equals one to m of g of theta j plus lambda over m the sum from g equals one to m of b of theta j right that's what we are just uh, rewriting things again so now because the dot product uh, is linear right it uh, i can put the dot product inside and i can uh, I collect everything together so what we have is something that is uh, some constant Minus what? So I have now one term that is two to the m, the sum from g equals one to m of this function f of theta j, right? Just because I'm collecting the terms here with the terms here. And then I have, uh, if I look at this term here, right? I can uh, also have all the possible pairwise products. What you see is that you get um, this term here is one over m squared the sum from j and j prime from one to m of k of theta j, theta j prime. Okay, 
So this now is in a, um, in, a, in, a, in a position where this kind of, this structure, this form of the energy is uh, very suggestive of a, of a physical system, right? So now we can really, uh, you know, we have, a, we have written an energy of a system of M interacting particles. Okay, so if you remember maybe from, you know, uh, class like uh, undergrad classes of mechanics or, you know, any kind of like a, yeah, like a, you know, like a course of mechanics, you can see that this really looks like the energy of a, of a M elements. And there's one term here that is some kind of like a force, right? That is acting, it's kind of like an, it's like an external force of the system that is acting indep like independently on each particle. And then you have some, so this is more like the, uh, you know, external field or external force. And this is the, the interaction current. Okay. And so I can think about this as I have, you know, now I can have this, uh, you know, analogy, right? Within neurons and particles. Okay, so I can think about my model as having a, you know, some in the domain in which I defined it. So I remember that I defined this thing to be in the domain D, right? That was the, that's where my neurons live. And I have a bunch of these neurons. And they they do their life, right? And they I, I, I have introduced an energy. And so this energy, right? And the natural thing is that this typically in physics, right? When you write an energy, it you can use it to define dynamics, right? Once you know the energy, you can uh, understand how things evolve, right? So you can imagine, okay, do I have the same phenomena here? Can I push this analogy even farther? Yes, of course you can, right? And so uh, now let's write down the dynamics, right? So the dynamics in our case are given by gradient flow, right? I just think about continuous time, right? So think about like gradient flow uh, on the energy loss, right? So uh, scale, let me just, uh, so if we if we take the gradient flow and we apply uh, a very not, a very, just gentle scaling, right? So I'm gonna just uh, take gradient flow uh, and I'm gonna scale it. Uh, with respect to theta one and theta m uh, gives me the associated Lagrangian dynamics. Okay, so what is this? It means that I'm, I'm going to define a velocity, right, for each particle that is going to be defined as the negative. And here I'm going to introduce a scaling that you will see why the scaling appears uh, for now. But just think that in terms of in gradient flow, you know, just re-parameterizing the flow doesn't change the dynamics, right? It just changes the uh, units of time, right? But it doesn't change the geometry of the flow. So I'm going to define it as the neg as the negative gradient of the loss, right? So let me just uh, let me just uh, uh, emphasize that this equation is exactly what you are using in your in your computer, right? When you train a neural network and you train the empirical loss with gradient descent, this is exactly the dynamics that you're following, right? Every particle, every neuron is going to be is going to evolve. Uh, in the direction that is the negative direction of the gradient, right? That's exactly how you train your network. Okay. So this is true for, for, for all the particles of the system. And if we just substitute what, what this means, right? Uh, you will see why now this normalization, this scaling makes sense. Now let's substitute exactly on the laws that we have here above, right? Um, so this M's and M's cancel out. And what we get is uh, the gradient of the force related to theta J 
minus one over m, the sum from j prime equals one to m of the gradient of the kernel at theta j theta j. Okay, so in more pictorial pictorial terms, why did we are defining at every point in time, right? We have a description of how each particle is moving, right? We have a good total control of the dynamics here, of the physics. Okay, so this is all very nice, but if you just pause for a second, imagine like this analogy, right? So we have a, you know, think that you have a neural network, let's say like, I don't know, a million of neurons, and you put this, you initialize these million neurons in some domain, like, a, you know, maybe within using Gaussian distribution, and you have a, an exact description of the velocity of each of the million uh, neurons, like mi million particles in this system. And so, of course, you can simulate the system, but you see that right, this description is a little bit brute force, right? We have an exact, we are tracking exactly the position of every one of the million of the particles, right? Do you think that this is how people typically model large system of particles? So think like, let's say that you have a gas, right? I don't know, like some, or like some, you know, complicated physical material, right? And you wanna understand what happens, like the, the, the properties of the system. Are you gonna take every possible molecule and exactly track where it's gonna be? Or is there some alternative description that we can use to understand things a little bit uh, more efficient? In fact, here, right, what, let, let me just add, right, that this, uh, so this Lagrangian description, is, in fact, uh, it becomes more and more complex the more particles you have, right? Because the system of equations, right? So I have one equation per particle, right? So the more particles I have, the more equations I have, right? So this system is, uh, you know, is increasingly complex, right? Uh, so this is defined over like the parameter space copies of the parameter space, right? So like every time I have a particle, I have another uh, copy of my parameter space. Uh, it is exact, so like it is at particle level. But but the resulting Initiation landscape is complicated, right? It's very complex. Okay, and it, in fact, it has like a, it has a bad one. Okay, so basically here we are, we are, we are going for a description that is completely deterministic. Right, and so here, what I'm, what the the question that we are asking is, is there an alternative? Right, uh, is there? Um, can we instead obtain a simpler? And here, the keyword is the collective behavior. Right. Okay, so to understand like to understand what function I'm learning, right? So we think about, let's look again, see what the functions are, right? So my function here is an average, right? So what I, what I care about is understanding the collective, like how these neurons together represent my function. I don't really care so much where each neuron is going. I only care about how they, what they can represent collectively. 
So this, this dynamics that you see here, in a sense, it's, it's, too, it's too ambitious, right? It's just trying to have like a perfect omnipotent vision of what everything, where everything is gonna go. We are asking here, can we instead settle for something that just nails the things I care about, like the collective behavior? So this is something that by no means is new, right? I mean, this is like, a, this observation is really uh, at the core of like the, you know, the, the revolutions in physics and mechanics you know, it dates at least to 19th century, right? If not before. So this is really like the, the, the description, the, the perspective from Euler, right? Like let's consider instead. What's called the Eulerian perspective. Okay, so the Eulerian perspective basically says, instead of trying to track in a system of many particles, instead of trying to track the velocity and be following exactly where each particle is going, I'm going to instead fix a position in my parameter space and just understand what is the probability to find a particle in that location and see how this probability evolves with time. Okay. So for this, we are going to make this um, change of, we are going to do like a change of variables if you want. So we have a, a, a description of the system. Uh, a Lagrangian description, which is uh, understanding the position and made the velocity of the particles. So this is in the copies of my parameter space. And we are gonna now associate it, right? Which position we are gonna associate it, it's empirical measure. Which is just the sum of M of putting a Dirac masses at mass one over M. Okay, and so this is an object that is in the space, it's a probability distribution, right? Uh, and, and this we are gonna denote the probability distribution of P of D, right? So this is the space of probability measures. So in, um, in uh, pictorial terms, right? So we had our previous picture from before, just gonna do it again. So I have a bunch of particles here. So uh, the system I can encode it by just giving you the location of the particles. But now we am gonna I'm gonna do something here, right? Where I'm gonna just simply encode like put little direct masses, right, on top of each particle, and give you instead just the probability distribution. Like you will notice, for example, that in the first description, right, in the, in the description on the left-hand side, uh, the description of the system, uh, you know, if I, if I change the order of the neurons, for example, uh, the system is the same, right? I mean, just saying which is particle, which particle one, which particle two, three, it doesn't matter, right? Yet, this encoding, the way to give you this vector, right, as a, as a collection of positions, it's not necessarily invariant. Whereas this description that you see here on the on the right hand side already captures this. First of all, the fact that it it only matters what they do in collect in collectivity, right? It doesn't matter the individual what each individual is doing. Okay, so so this is really what's uh, this is more like the you know, uh, right? Just move that a little bit uh, down. So this is the Lagrangian view. This is the Eulerian view. So now we have really changed, we have really changed spaces, right? So in one hand, we had these copies of a finite dimensional space. Now we have an object that lives in a new space, right? That is the space of probability distributions. So here we really had, like we have a finite dimensional Euclidean space. And here we have a space that seems a little bit exotic, right? It's like the space of all the probability distributions of our domain, right? So in fact, this space is infinite dimensional. But you know, as you will see now, it's really non-Euclidean. 
And you will notice also that in the Eulerian view, the number of particles M doesn't change the domain, right? Like the domain, like the probability distributions, right? Uh, I can have them to be, uh, to have M points, uh, 2M doesn't matter, right? The space is the same. Whereas in the, in the left-hand side, if I change the number of particles, I need to change the space. All right. So let's see how, let's see how, how this thing works. So now let's try to use this new object that we have introduced, okay? So the first thing that we are gonna to try to do is to rewrite our function, our model, in terms of this new variable, the measure. So the model, like the function that we're learning, that was this um, function like this, right? It was one of m, the sum from g plus one to m of g of theta j x. If we try to express it in terms of the measure, what do we get? And this, I realize that if, if, if you are not familiar, uh, if you have never seen this kind of uh, empirical measures before, it might, it might seem like a little bit of a artifact, like a very artificial thing. But, uh, but you will see how, why it's actually uh, helpful. So we can now try to write it again in terms of the measure. So what do we know about, so the fact that this empirical measure is a sum of Dirac's, if you remember, like one of the properties of the Dirac measure is that when you integrate the Dirac measure against a test function, what is the output that you get? So just as a recall, like as a, as a recall here, that if I just take a, you know, mu is a Dirac measure at some location, right? Then uh, uh, integrate the if I just integrate this function that's called theta zero against the Dirac measure, right? What does one get? If you remember, is a test function in the location of this Dirac? Uh... Perfect. Thank you very much. Right? You can use the Dirac measure as a as a formalism to evaluate integrals. Right? So now if we go above and we see what we're looking at, right? We have a function G that is evaluated at different points, theta one, theta two, until theta M. But this is exactly where we are putting our Dirac's. So what we have here is that this uh, function is really um, obtained as testing our neuron against the Dirac measure, against the empirical measure. Okay. So now we like, a, and, and, and again, this is really because the, the empirical measure is just like a linear combination. It's like an average of Dirac masses placed exactly at the right point, okay? So now we have real, really something quite interesting, right? Is that if you look at this equation on the left-hand side of this equation, the dependency between the Lagrangian view, like the position of the parameters theta, Right, like the dependency between theta and the function is not linear, right? Just because the thetas are inside this function G, right? G can be an arbitrary function, right? So this dependency here is, okay, so if I just, uh, in that side of the frontier, I have a nonlinear dependence, okay, between, uh, phi and theta. But if now I look at this side of the boundary, what is the dependency between my function and my new object, which is the measure mu? Now I have a linear dependency, right? Now phi is linear with respect to nu, okay? Which is really something that uh, you should, uh, you should now stop doing what you're doing and start start paying attention, right? Because if you have now a function that depends linearly on, um, oh, seems that there's a delay in what I'm writing. Oh. Okay, I just realized that uh, what I'm saying and what I'm writing, there's a big delay. Uh, let me just see that. It no, works. it seems okay, no? Seems okay. 
Okay, so yes, the, you, the, the last line was phi is linear with respect to the mu. Okay, okay, well, okay, it's just my screen then doesn't work. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, okay, perfect, so I'll just keep going. Um, so now I have something that is pretty interesting, right? Is that I have a linear dependency between my new variable, that is the empirical measure, and the function. Which means that now if I just do the extra mile, now let me see what happens with the energy, with the loss. So like the loss of the system, the energy, as we said before, expressed in terms of the measure, now is now becomes, let's just write it. I'm gonna use the measure. Remember what we had before, right? So if we go, go again, let me just copy, copy and paste it. I'm just gonna forget about the constant part. So recall that that's what we had before. Okay, so now let's try to re-express this thing in terms of the measure. So we can use the same trick as before, right? So now I can just uh, uh, identify that there's one term here that is just integrating the force against the measure. Right, that, that is associated with this term. And then the other term, right, that you see here, like the, the term that involves this um, uh, interaction. There's a question. Uh, yes, um, I, I just well, I, I didn't understood the understand the part of where, where you said. So on the right side of the integral, phi is yes. linear with respect to this measure. Yes. D do you mean like the integrand is linear, or yeah, what it's is this linear. So, so you know, like that. Yeah, so linear, it means that uh, that um, if I want to, like, uh, if I have two measures now, right, and I consider, like, the, the mixture between the two measures, they are going to define a corresponding function, which is also, like, the linear combination of the two, right? So, so in other words, when you, have a, when you have a relationship of this form, that is, like, a, you know, um, phi equals the integral of some complicated expression, let's call this, I don't know, um, h of x times mu of dx, right? Um, let me just put, uh, sorry. Just, uh, so that the notation is not so different. So if I have like some phi of x, that is just the integral of g of theta x mu d theta, right? So here what I mean is that, um, integration is a linear thing, right? So, so if you have uh, now two measures, right? Like a mu one and mu two, and you consider now like a mu that is a one half of mu one plus mu two, you can now see that uh, if, you, if you use this uh, kind of uh, linear combination of two measures to define a new function, right? You know that- um, um, let me just Yeah, you, you have like the two integrals. No? Exactly, phi of x, is one half of phi one of x plus phi two of x, right? So this is really not what you get if you do the same thing in the space of thetas, right? If you do it in the Lagrangian domain, if you take two near, two parameters of the neuron and you look at the average, the function that you get has nothing to do with the average of the two functions. Okay? Got, it, got it, thanks. Yeah, of course. Okay, so now we have this, uh, uh, we take the energy and we try to express it in terms of the measure. And what you see is that we have this term that is the force term, and then the other term. So this is an integral over d, and then there is integral over d times d, which is just integrating the kernel against the measure, the measure with respect to two branches. Right? That's this thing. 
Okay, so now we are really, uh, you should really now look at this uh, new loss function. Now it's expressed in the space of measures. And what do you see? We observe that L of U is now quadratic with respect to mu. And in fact, in fact, it is convex with respect to mu. Right, remember, uh, recall that K is PSD, right? So I have a quadratic form where the operator is positive semi-definite, right? So it means that the loss is convex. Okay, so that seems like a, almost too good to be true, right? Because wait, what have I done? I taken a system that was very complicated. I told you that you know this uh, uh, problem was very highly non-convex. We just uh, take the parameters, we re-express them in terms of the measure, and now suddenly, boom, the loss function uh, becomes convex in this new parameter. So when you have a convex function that you optimize, suddenly you you might suspect, you might uh, you might uh, uh, you know have the impression that then the, the optimization problem is solved, right? Because uh, you know finding the global minima of a convex function, I can do it with gradient descent, right? There's a convergence, global convergence guarantees. Um, so are we done? Well, there's a little bit of a, of a problem here, right? Is that, and this is like a subtlety that the convexity that you see here, and I, uh, when I was uh, giving the example to Victor, uh, uh, I already kind of revealed my game, is that in order to really leverage or exhibit this convexity, what do I need to do? I need to take two measures, right? And consider like a kind of a convex combination, right? This is called like a mixture, right? So if you are used to, to um, if you have some background in statistics or probability, right? If I take two measures, two probability measures, and I combine them like this, I'm creating a mixture, right? So in fact, this, um, Okay, so basically what I'm, what I'm saying here is that L is convex with respect to the, essentially to the, to the geometry of linear mixtures. And this is not necessarily um, compatible with the way we are gonna be able to move in the gradient space, right? So, so, so basically this connection between convexity and gradient descent, uh, what we are seeing here is that we, if we use our intuition from Euclidean spaces, uh, we end up with a, almost like a contradiction, right? And so how can we actually uh, resolve this contradiction or this apparent contradiction, right? So we have a convex structure but then I'm saying that it's not, it's not necessarily something that I can use uh, to my advantage when I do optimization. So the, the, the answer, like the, the, the thing that resolves this ambiguity is that essentially when, when we think about gradient descent, like uh, uh, however, the gradient descent Are operating as we as were as we are going to see in a minute, they are they are they are, they operate in a different geometry in the space of probability measures, right? Because come to a different okay, and so okay, so basically what, what I'm what I'm trying to to, to reveal here is that like uh, trying to understand the relationship between gradient descent and the metric, right? And so um, like uh, kind of the question here is what is the relationship 
between like gradient descent or gradient flow and the metric. Okay, and for this we we are gonna uh, so so the 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 key concept here is the notion of a proximal operator. Right. So let let me just uh, very briefly um, recall what this what this proximal view is, and so hopefully this will clarify a little bit the the situation. So it's the proximal viewpoint. It's almost like right uh, of uh, gradient distance. Okay, so let's uh, look at the standard gradient descent, right? So like the standard, uh, let's say Euclidean gradient descent a step. We just write it as theta plus one is equal to theta t minus some gradient step um, times the gradient of a function and so there's a way where we can write exactly what this update means as the solution of a, of a optimization problem inside right it's like this is what's called this variational view so we can write this formula as the arc mean with respect to theta of what of the function at theta t plus the gradient at theta t times theta minus theta t plus one over two eta, the norm between theta and theta t, the squared norm. Okay, so you can verify that in what you have here inside these brackets is a function that is quadratic in theta. Right, so it's a quadratic function in theta. So you can find the global minima in closed form. And so what is the global minima of this function is exactly theta t plus one. And so what we are doing here is that we are just uh, breaking out. So we have one term here that is the linear approximation of f at theta t. And this is what we call this proximity term. And so here, uh, it's very not the very it's very natural, right? To 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 really think that any kind of descent algorithm has some parameter theta t, and basically what I'm saying, what I'm trying to do is I'm going I'm trying to look for the next point in some neighborhood of theta t. So I want to do steepest descent. I want to try to okay, what is the point in the neighborhood of where I am, where the function decreases the most? So this all looks very natural, but of course the question is how do you measure proximity, right? How do you measure this, like how close you are from theta t? Here for the standard gradient descent, we are using the L2 norm, right? So the more natural question is how do we measure proximity, okay? So L2 metric, is you know one option right one choice but not always a good choice in particular when we are talking about gradient descent in the space of measures uh measure spaces are not l2 spaces right so there's no canonical way to do gradient descent directly and apply it to the space of measure, right? Just because this, this, this thing doesn't make sense, right? Like the L2 distance between two measures makes no sense, okay? And so the generalization, like uh, uh, the general, like uh, basically the, the generalization of gradient descent on more general metrics is a kind of generally called a mirror descent. 
Okay, this is something from a uh, Nemirovsky and Yudin kind of classic optimization, right? From the I think it's eighty three. Okay, and so the 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 idea that you should keep in mind, right? Like the the canonical form, like a, you know, uh, in essence. We can define general optimization, like general form of gradient descent or mirror descent. Uh, I can think about them as being uh, something that looks like uh, this is the arc mean with respect to theta of my function plus some proximity term and some divergence, right? Like a divergence between theta and theta. And this is a divergence function. It's called the Bregman divergence uh, uh, function. So think about this function uh, measures proximity between theta t and theta. Okay, and so different algorithms uh, result by making different choices of these divergence. Okay, so now if you look at the back of our problem, uh, measure space. Okay, so what do we have? We had our Lagrangian view. Uh, let me just write it like this, sorry. We have the Lagrangian view. We have this L'Oreal view. So here we had some uh, theta t that we could uh, evolve to, let's say, theta t plus one. Just let me just uh, discretize time for now. Uh, and this here, we just do it with a uh, Euclidean gradient descent, right, or gradient flow, if you want. So we, we describe the equation of how the system moves, right? We just take gradient step with respect to the, uh, to the position of the neurons. We also knew, we also have seen how to associate to every state of the system a corresponding uh, description in terms of the measure, right? Like the mu t, this is like the, the remember that is this one over m, the sum from j equals one to m, or the Dirac at theta j of t. Right? So we can do that here and we can do that here, right? So we can also define t plus one uh, accordingly. So now the question that I ask, right, is, uh, okay, what is then this step, right? So, so what kind of, uh, what kind of descent Does this update correspond? Okay, so remember, like again, the picture, right? That you that I I like to have in mind is that I have again this uh, system of particles. And because I'm I'm defining dynamics in the space of particles, right? These dynamics are going to move, right? And this motion in the in the in the position of the particles, of course, is going to see is going to be felt in the uh, learning view, right? It's going to create some dynamics in the space of measures. And so, what is the right formalism, the right way to un to understand this that this motion in the space of measures, right? That's what we are trying to understand here. Okay, so okay, let's try to see that together. Recall that um, the position, uh, the velocity that we described was the gradient of f at theta j minus um, one over m, the sum from j prime equals one to m of the kernel of theta j, theta j prime. Right, that's what we just saw before. 
Okay, so now we are going to use um, so using the empirical measure, right? Mt. Let's try to write the dynamics in terms of the measure. Okay, so we saw that the velocity, right? At every point in for every particle, just try to express this equation in terms of the empirical measure. So we can just write it like this. We can just write it as the gradient of F at the, the j of t and the integral, right? So we just, uh, when we see this um, uh, sum over discrete sum of our particles, we just use the empirical measure and replace it by an integration, right? Like the integration of the gradient of the kernel at theta j of t theta and then mu t of t theta. So that's the integral over t. Okay, and now we can um, uh, interpret this as the negative gradient of some function. Okay, and this function I evaluated at gt of uh, theta g of t. So this function has two arguments, right? So this function g, uh, let me just define it here. G is a function that depends on a position and a measure. And it just define it as the negative force plus the integral of K theta theta prime with mu of D theta prime. Okay. So this actually is, an, is a very important object that in physics, this object is called an instantaneous potential. Okay, in physics, G is called instantaneous potential of the system. Okay, and why, why is it called instantaneous potential? Well, because look at what happened with the gradient, right? Like its gradient G, right, of theta T defines, so if I look at, so that think about this function G that is defined over D, right? Like it's defined over the whole domain, right? Like uh, theta belongs to D. So the gradient defines kind of like a, a vector field, like a flow over all the parameter space. Okay, and so its gradient uh, defines a velocity field over D that any particle, okay, so let's, if you go, if you look above, right, what do you see in this equation? is that the velocity that, that every particle feels is the negative gradient of this potential, right? So typically, if you remember from, uh, from uh, you know, Newtonian mechanics, right? Like the potential function, right? Its gradient is what defines me the velocity, like the force. And so here we have exactly the same thing. The only difference is that this potential depends on time, right? Like this function, right? A priori, that's uh, right, this potential depends on where the current state of the particles are, right? Like if the measure, if the, if the measure over the, the particles changes, the potential changes. Okay? That uh, any particle kind of feels, right? So basically the idea is that now I'm in, uh, I'm in this domain D, right? And I, if I look at the gradient of G, this is defining kind of a vector field, right? It's gonna it's gonna define some vector field, right? Everywhere. And what is the effect of this vector field? Is that if I if now you put a neuron anywhere, 
boom, it's going to start moving, right? According to this velocity field. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so now let's see, um, let's, let's see if we can make sense of all this function. So consider now, At this function, that sign, which is a test function that is uh, smooth, it goes from D to R. And uh, let's see how the test function interacts with the measure. Okay, so by definition, I know that this, because this, this is the empirical measure, I have one over M, the T equals one to M of the test function, related at the positions of the particles. Okay. Now, what we're gonna do, this is like always the same thing, is that now let's take time derivative, right? Let's take the time derivative. Okay, both in the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Well, in the left-hand side, at the time derivative is precisely the partial derivative, like exactly what I want to understand, right? It's like how the measure evolves over time. And now we're gonna, let's see what happens on the right-hand side. So I have one over M, the sum from G equals one to M of, now let's look at the derivative of this with respect to time. So first I need to take the derivative of the test function, take the gradient of the test function, multiplied by the velocity. Okay. Now I just apply the, the, thing, the thing that I just, on, just uh, got uh, right now, which is that is the velocity of the particle is the negative of the gradient of the potential function. Okay, so this is minus one over M, the sum from G equals one to M of the dot product between the gradient of Psi and theta J of T with the gradient of G at J of T and then the measure. Okay, this is just like applying the definition that I just uh, I computed. And now we are always going to do the same trick is that every time I see like a sum over particles, I'm going to replace it by an integral, okay, using the empirical measure instead. So this is just minus the integral over the whole domain of the gradient of, of the uh, test function at theta, multiplied uh, dot product with the potential function at theta, divided at mu t. And all this is integrated with respect to the theta. Okay. <clears throat> so now we are done because this is really what uh, gives us a, gives us a relationship. Right now we have an equation that is closed at the level of the of the measure. What I mean is that now I can relate the variations of the measure in terms of something that only depends on the measure. Right. So like everything that you see here. Uh, depends, like it gives me like how to evolve the measure over time. So this is known in physics as the continuity or transport equation. Or like a transport equation. Okay, so basically here, what, what is reflecting is that the probability measure, like the mass, like the probability mass, right, cannot be created or destroyed, right? It can only be transported, right? Like the, the probability measure is just moving around. Okay, so basically the mass is conserved. All right, and so another way to think, to write this uh, equation in weak form, right? So like the associated, E 
uh, is written as just in short run, like saying that the derivative of mu t is just um, the divergence, right? This is the this divergence is really saying that I first need to take the gradient of the test function of the gradient of the potential theta mu t times mu t. Okay. And this is actually has uh, this PD is, is known. This is called the Liu Wheel equation. Okay, and so uh, I promised you, right, that this uh, dynamics is a way to translate gradient, like the gradient descent or the gradient flow over the space of uh, neurons into a evolution in the space of meshes. So you would expect that this is also a gradient flow, right? Because I'm, you know, I'm just changing the, I'm just evolving the system, optimizing a loss with respect to, and I'm just expressing this loss with respect to the measure. So does this thing, so question, do these dynamics correspond also to a gradient flow? And the answer is that it's yes, right? But the gradient flow, uh, uh, these are, so if I, if again, if I use this proximal interpretation, right, like the, the proximal interpretation, is given of what's called um, passes time gradient flow. Okay, so if I wanted to think about the evolution of the measure at t plus one, if I discretize time again, this is the solution of looking for a measure that is going to minimize my loss plus one over two eta. And here, the way to measure proximity in the space of measures is using what's called a Wasserstein distance. Okay, and this is actually, a, this scheme is a, a, for those of you who are interested in, a, you know, like a, a, a geometry or space of measures or like even like PDEs, this is a very famous scheme, right? This is called a JKO scheme from Jordan, uh, Klein and Otto. Okay, so this is the JKO scheme. Okay, and understanding, uh, you know, understanding uh, like a uh, refined mathematical properties of this scheme is what uh, one of the reasons, among others, that uh, Cedric Villani got the Fields Medal. Right, so this is really like a very interesting and very deep area of math that is really in the interface of uh, mathematics and physics. And uh, it's funny that uh, in this context, it also appears when you try to model uh, shallow neural networks. All right. And so um, just a few remarks, uh, just again, as usual, running a little bit out of time. Um, is that at this point, we haven't made any approximation error, right? Like, uh, so this description, Is exact, right? So we haven't we haven't really made any approximation, right? It's a it's a if you if you just were implementing your uh, you know implementing a shallow neural network in a computer and just uh, doing a gradient descent with very 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 small step step size, and you would be tracking the evolution of the empirical measure, that would be exactly the evolution, right? Like the PDE is exactly giving you this evolution. Um, 
there's other remarks is that if you add noise to the gradient updates, you obtain related equations. So the, 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 if you do that, you are basically replacing the gradient flow by something that is called like a Langevin dynamics. Then uh, there's also like a, the, the, the associated evolution in the space of measures is also related. It's also, it also changes, uh, then translates. Um, into another equation, another PDE in the space of matches. So basically, you go from the Leo Beale equation to some equation that is called the Mackin Blazov. So maybe some of you are familiar with these kind of things, right? So Makin Blazov, think it think it as a generalization of uh, a more popular equation, which is called the Fokker Planck. Like Fokker Planck equation is the would be the equivalent where the like the instantaneous potential is fixed. Okay, and let me also say that uh, uh, like it's a good time that uh, this uh, this uh, basically this connection. Between uh, Wasserstein gradient flow and training of shallow neural nets was made by. Does this work by Shiza back, uh, Rotskov and and then Iden. Um, Song May, uh, Montanari and Nguyen, and also uh, Sitting Nano. And Spilopoulos. All uh, for some interesting thing, all in the same year, like uh, all in 2018. Right, so this is still like relatively recent. Okay. Uh, so I have a uh, 15 minutes. Uh, I will just, uh, okay, so I have 15 minutes. So I'm going to um, try to give you some of the main, maybe more like uh, uh, most interesting mathematical aspects of this analogy. So the first one is really the, uh, um, the mean field region. Mean field region. Okay, so what is the mean field regime? It's like consider evolution of the system as M increases, right? As M goes to infinity. Okay, so just, uh, um, just to see what, what I mean is that I have this, uh, like the state of the system in the Eulerian side and I index it by M. So this, is, this would be like the state after time t with the, state, the initialization of the system at time zero, right? That is drawn IID from some measure of mu bar. Okay, so just the, 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 um, the idea as I said before, is that at time zero, we just initialize this neurons all IID according to some underlying distribution mu bar and then let the system evolve. Okay, so, um, just again, maybe drawing a picture. Here now we have the space of measures. We have some object here that is a mu bar. And then I am gonna draw 
some neighborhoods that contains the measure at time zero where I've drawn M particles, okay? So this is the empirical measure, right? So, so mu zero M, that is one over M uh, J equals one to M of the Dirac of initial state of the system, right? So this is empirical measure associated with mu bar. Okay, so that's a question here. All right, so um, what happens, and you don't need to be very formal, as M grows. So the, uh, if you wanna like another picture, right? Maybe think about what would see, what would this thing look like in low dimension, right? I have some measure mu bar, which maybe has density mu bar. And now I'm just considering empirical versions, right? So the empirical versions would be just drawing points from that measure, right? So maybe I have a point here, a point here, maybe a couple of points here, etc. right? So as you have more and more and more points, what happens between uh, uh, mu bar and mu zero M? Do you think that they get somehow close to each other or they are always very different? What, what do you think? Thank you. Right, they are closer and closer. And the, the right sense in which to say that is in the, it's called in the weak sense, right? So if I test this to measure against any test function, like the result is gonna get closer and closer, right? This is really like the law of large numbers, right? So, so this picture that I tried to draw here, in a sense, it's like the right picture, right? So like it's M grows, these measures uh, get close to each other. But now I'm gonna consider dynamics. So at any initialization, right? I can just draw the, the trajectory of the system, right? This would be now uh, mu at time t with the, set, with the corresponding initial condition, right? So natural question is what happens as M grows? Does this do these trajectories as now uh, m keeps in, increasing? Maybe these trajectories, right, are going to start, you know, all maybe get closer and closer, right? There's one trajectory here that might be interesting, which is the mean field trajectory, right? Like the trajectory where instead of using starting from the initial empirical measure, I start from mu bar, right? That's the trajectory that you see here. Okay, so this is called this is the. In field evolution. So mu t solves the, the same the same PDE, right? With initial condition mu zero equals mu bar. Right, so the only thing that changes in this trajectory is the initial condition, right? The, the law is the same. So you might expect, you might suspect that if the initial conditions get closer to mu bar, are the trajectories gonna get closer to each other? Seems intuitive, right? If things are how they should be, you know, if I have a PDE and, uh, and uh, I have a small, 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 small error in the initial condition, is this error gonna propagate and blow up? or is there some, some smoothness in the world that can make these errors also not propagate too much, right? So uh, fortunately we are more in the, in the second category, right? So we really have uh, something that is nice is, and this is a theorem from, from these papers. Uh, she's right back, uh, what's called Eve, MMM, and Cedric Nano is that again, for informally, for any xt mu t of m 
converges weekly to mu t as t equals to infinity, where t solves this equation. Okay. So in other words. the dynamics and sampling, right? So if I if I just draw the picture again, I have mu bar, and then I can do something, I can sample from mu bar, right? I'm just gonna write it like this. Cool. You sample, you, you get then mu m, at, uh, sorry, mu zero m, and then you can do another thing. You can do two things with the measure. You can sample or you can evolve, right? And you can evolve with time to get mu t. And here you can sample, right? And here you can evolve. So what we are saying is that this diagram in the limit commutes, right? So if I first evolve, right? And I just follow this path. And then I view, I, I, I sample, let's say many, many particles. I will get the same thing than if first I sample and then I evolve, right? So in other words, um, dynamics and sampling commute in the limit. of m goes to infinity. All right. Um, any questions about this? All right. So I, we have uh, five minutes left. Um, I'm just going to uh, right. Um, I'm just going to give you some last. Yeah, there's a question. Sorry. Yes. Um, I I remember that at the beginning we started with the least square laws, but is this mm -hmm. framework does this framework apply also to other type of losses? Very good question. The answer is yes. So the framework applies to convex losses. So you can uh, you can also apply it for uh, classification if you do logistic regression. And the framework also is quite robust to um, regu different, different uh, regularization schemes, right? So you can uh, put different priors on the functions. Uh, the scheme, on the other hand, is very, very, very relying on the shallow architecture. So if you wanted to apply this scheme to understand deeper neural networks, uh, you can formally start writing things, but it's very, very, very tedious and complicated to extract anything, right? So, so in particular, the thing I wanted to write now that has to do with the global convergence. So, okay, uh, let me just maybe uh, uh, just uh, conclude, like basically give you, what are, what are the main questions, right? That, uh, so what, with this framework, what do you, what do you hope to do, right? So like, the two main questions, right, that uh, that we are still interested, right, that are basically the, the main questions that we were set to study originally is, first question is under what conditions um, does this PD converge? to the global minimum of L, right? So remember that this is more like a convergence in time. And the other question is how are the dynamics 
affected in terms of over parametrization. Okay, so basically this is more like the convergence of the fluctuations in M. Okay, so there are two uh, there are two uh, important uh, quantities here that we would like to quantify, right? Is that uh, uh, how long does it take to find good uh, solutions, right? Basically solutions that have a small loss. And the other one is how many neurons do we need to realize these losses, right? Remember that here we are in a framework, right? Where um, in a sense, the number of particles is just uh, uh, like some, some way to parameterize empirical measures, right? But the framework is more general. So um, I guess, okay, so we don't have time to, to describe, uh, you know, as detailed results about convergence in time and M, but uh, let me say that, yeah, there's some results that are uh, qualitative, like so existing results. Results are, so there are existing, sorry, um, positive results. global convergence, but they are all qualitative in M and in fact, actually, and also in T, so no, no rates. So this is really, uh, uh, you know, maybe a good way to. It's a good now uh, time to, to to wrap it up. Uh, uh, I will, if there is interest, I can maybe post the, the notes of the thing I didn't have time to cover. But I guess that uh, it's a good it's a good point to it's a good moment to conclude is that we can really uh, uh, see what this uh, description. Uh, of shallow neural network in terms of these measure spaces. What it does, it really provides us a very rich and I would say profound description of how training evolves, like uh, what happens with training of these neural networks. The downside is that it's a very qualitative description, right? So you can only understand the phenomena collective behavior as the number of neurons grows and grows and grows and grows, right? If you want to try to get any kind of quantitative results, say, okay, I will need a number of neurons that is some polynomial in dimension. That's not something that this theory can capture, right? And in fact, we know, and that's something that we, uh, yeah, so, so it's something that maybe for another time, that there exists actually negative results, right? So we know that there are some target functions for which we can hope, we can actually provide uh, training algorithms that are uh, that succeed in polynomial time, but we also have target functions for which this is probably not true. So this means the theory does not is not able to make a difference between these cases. But still, it uh, it it has this nice advantage that it's a very global theory, right? So we can understand everything uh, in this framework. We can understand dynamics, we can understand approximation, and we can also understand generalization. And so. Um, Anyway, I hope that you enjoyed the lecture and I will put uh, uh, maybe my lecture notes, I will just put them on the website whenever we are able to do that. Uh, uh, okay, so with that, I'll thank you very much. And I guess I'll see you, um, I don't know if it's in a week or two. Um, I'll, I'll just follow up on, uh, on the email. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye.